why do you want to even do that? <laughs> so uh, first my PRS slide, so I'm a member since October 2016, so that's my sixth PRS since I missed um, the one in the summer last time and I've currently won, um, so actually the talk today is submitted currently by TMI and the review and then there are um, further publications like the Pyrene and Framework and then the uh, help with the learning with non-operator reduction nature paper with Andreas and all the other co-authors, right, and then um, uh, two journals with um, Bernhard. So let's go to the to the uh, main motivation, the hybrid imaging. So uh, if we think about that, it would be a nice thing to uh, start to combine our main modalities like X-ray and, um, and MRI for interventional or diagnostical use. Then we can think about multiple or different um, benefits like um, reduced treatment time or treatment specificity or we have speed up um, we can use the x-ray maybe to speed up the MR acquisition or we have dose reduction as we can um, switch between the both modalities or something like that and the main question um, which co um, comes up here is how to acquire both thickness and preserve, um, preserve the benefits of both of the modalities and we are looking, especially in the project, towards an interventional MR X-ray setting where we think about catheter-based interventions for cardiac or neuro interventions to setting stents or something like that. And there um, are multiple challenges coming up. Like um, the workflow is mostly with fluor on fluoroscopic imaging, which is not um, maybe very beneficial for the MR device. Um, also, this should be work in real time, otherwise stent setting placement and thrombectomy wouldn't also not be very useful for the physicist if they have to wait a few minutes. And also we have to keep in mind that we need interventional devices for that, like normal catheters are not necessarily visible in the MR, while it's very easy in the X-ray. So this is also um, opens up the, the point where we can fuse them maybe very nicely. So, um, and this concludes to the point that we decided to go for an MR projection imaging. Um, where does this come from? So actually if we have a patient then we can um, put him into our device and then we can look at the patient uh, um, in the office Fourier transform so we make a f uh, FFT of our patient and then we can use the MR or the x-ray um, to <coughs> acquire the sigmas of that. So actually this means we can either acquire MR signals, um, which are arbitrary trajectories, um, mostly are Cartesian sampling, which are, but also means you have tomographic slices already, which is not necessarily helpful, especially as your X-ray device is only to able uh, to acquire projection images. And um, they are then, so if we would sample the stuff in, uh, polar co in polar, on a polar grid or a polar trajectory, then we would have non-distorted um, MR projections, while the X-ray, of course, in the normal setting is a point source, so we have perspective distorted um, projections. And this means even if we acquire MR projections, we cannot overlay them directly for the interventional setting, which is um, not very beneficial then for the setting I motivated, especially for the catheters, where you think on you want to maybe show the edges very clear to the vessel and the catheter, and then with one distortion and not distortion would not fit together. <coughs> Yeah, and of course you can um, reconstruct that back to the patient domain with different um, reconstruction algorithms like the X-ray, then you can use an FBP algorithm or the MR with an IFFT or a NAFT if you have a non-Cartesian sampling, right? And we have also artifacts as you can see in the patient because he's not smiling, right? <laughs> Um, so coming to the setting, what we are looking at now, so um, we are looking into uh, parallel projections from the MR and also directly the cone beam projection of the X-ray. And we want to have both of them in the cone beam, so in the dis um, distorted projection. So this means we have to sample multiple parallel projections with the MR to get the same um, visual impression as the X-ray. And I visualized this now here, you can see that, um, so this is the cotton beam projection <coughs> plane and you have, we can now think about what parallel projections do we want to measure. And if I talk later in the talk from a 5x5 five five rebinning, I mean that we take um, these orange grid sampling points, so means 25 parallel projections, and then to try to interpolate somehow um, towards the cone beam projections so we can directly fit it to the X-ray one.
<coughs> and we can use this, we can start this now um, just with the reconstruction formulas and just as a recap, so if we have AX equals P, we can say we can reconstruct our object X with the back rejection, A transpose, and the pseudo inverse of this inverse bracket. And then we have our acquired projections here. So, and from the continuous um, analytical solution, we know that this is um, from the filtered back projection scheme, so we can also say this is a multiplication in the Fourier domain with the filter K. And this is what we uh, use now, um, just starting the, with the setting. We want to have a cone beam projection from our object um, X, from the patient under the system, um, under the geometry described by the system matrix ACB. <clears throat> and we could now think about, yeah, we let's just substitute the X with a reconstruction based on parallel projections, which we are then able to acquire with our MR device. So we can um, plug this actually in the reconstruction formula here with G are our parallel projections we acquire with the MR. This should lead us to a, to a cone beam projection C we want to have. <clears throat> so the problem is now that for the filter back projection case of full reconstruction, we know what this, in, what this pseudo inverse is. But uh, in this case, um, which is very highly limited data or very limited angle, if you look at on a certain point, this would not, uh, we are not really knowing what this um, pseudo inverse is looking like or what the operand is. So we think about, we could just map this to a neural network, but we have to constrain it somehow. So let's test um, different hypotheses on this, on this operand, and then try if we can approximate a good operation, even if we don't know what actually um, is happening there. <coughs> So this means we replace this pseudo inverse by a filter K in the Fourier domain, and we will um, train this for a shift invariant, no, uh, for a for projection invariant filter. Sorry, this is a mistake here. Um, where we apply for each projection, we acquire a different filter. <coughs> so this would be this would be then the network, uh, and just our MSE optimization formula. So the filters we are looking at, I show you differently, so we can think about K just as a full spanning Fourier domain, but this would be maybe not very beneficial because then we have a lot of parameter to train. If you think about our filter will be a real valued filter, we can just use the upper square and then use the point symmetry of the Fourier domain to reduce the, f the parameter size by one to one fourth uh, or one quarter and then we can uh, take more constraint on that and say we could also imagine a symmetry in this upper quadrant or even looking for a polar filter which is the same for each which further reduces and we evaluate this in different experiments which of these filters are uh, pr providing the best results for us here. So, and we all training this just on numerical phantoms. I show you here the uh, visualization of the phantom we use for testing. So we designed the phantom just with um, cylinders ar um, around the cone beam rays, which means if we are in the correct cone beam uh, projection, we will get perfect circles here, while um, a parallel projection of these or a wrongly repent projection will always have um, blurry, blurriness and smoothing of these circles. So this very is beneficial to acquire a gradient and then update the network. <coughs> so we have three experiments. So um, what's the filter performance? What's about the training data? Is it very um, worthy to use numerical versus real data? And then we have an, a, vis a visualization of the overall performance. Um, so if we look at the default performance, um, we can see, so we measure it. Also, these phantoms are very nice then to measure the performance of the algorithm as we can compute a full width half maximum for each of the circles and then compute the uh, uh, we can create a box plot out of that and then we can see that the different assumptions of the filter like um, the, the filter quadrant, the partial symmetric filter and the, um, the rotational symmetric filter which the pure polar one is. We can see for example this orange one, this is worse than the other two which means probably the, the polar filter, one the polar filter was, was a constraint or an assumption too heavy for the operand really we are thinking for so we're getting worse than the other ones. So we reduce the freedom here um, too much. 
But in general, you can see, so these are now the subsampling cases where we say we want to have um, as minimal, a minimal amount of projections. And even if we use 5 by 5, 25 projections, we can um, reconstruct these circles very clearly and have really cl distinct circles here, which is very nice. If you look now for the numerical versus real data, so just the same setting using the same network, training one time on a public available data set, the ICSI data set is a head MR data set and one just with the numerically um, computed mm, training data, we can see actually that we don't have a lot of difference here, which means we can uh, um, train this network and getting a filter which performs um, very similar even if we just use numerical data and don't see any real data. But we can then, I show you that uh, on the next slide, just um, go to, to real data without any problems here. <coughs> so now for the overall performance, um, we just compare uh, the baseline, which is the geometric rebending. So like you know from the DDMIB one just for 3D and then the, the two different filters, um, we can see that the baseline, we can even don't can't compute any FEHM values for the 3x3 three three, um, downsampling case, so here the classical method fails totally, while on the other one it's just worse than the filter we, we proposed now. So we can see that um, <coughs> our proposed tomographic rebinning is better working and for the hard cases is um, still working while the other one is not um, working well anymore. And we can visualize it also on this known angiographic data set. This is, of course, simulated, um, but um, is to show what would be the capability if we would have angiographic MR projections. Then we would see that on the left side, this is the proposed method. We can still um, reconstruct this vessel tree very nicely just by, uh, I think this is three by three sampling, while the geometric rebinning, the classical method, totally fails to reconstruct this um, vessel tree. And if you imagine now you want to make a stent or a thrombectomy, then it's very um, yeah, not helpful if you want to see the cathedra and the vessel and where, where your instruments are, while here we are, may, uh, we are probably still able to show the physicists and uh, the, the information we want to give them. <laughs> <clears throat> so to conclude, we were able um, to present you a novel tomographic rebinning algorithm which not is based on the geometric one and s a severe, have a severe lack on, um, on interpolation artifacts. Uh, the proposed method outperforms this baseline and I think the very important or in a nicely interesting thing is that we can show that there is no need for real training data to train such a network and to come up with um, a good result which is very beneficial for the medical field where we lack often on the, the real data, right? So, and this concludes my talk. Thank you.